Hello, um, welcome to the sustainability sessions. My name is Vanessa Norwood and I'm creative director of the Building Centre. So the sustainability sessions are a series of talks that explore aspects of sustainability in the built environment. This first set of talks celebrates retrofit projects that aim to reduce carbon emissions while giving existing buildings new life. And the fourth talk uh, is on the Castle Acre Water Tower, and the project's going to be presented by Mike Tonkin of Tonkin Lu Architecture. So Tonkin Lu was founded in 2001 with Anna Lu. The practice has been formed, informed by a pursuit of form and lessons observed from the natural world and an understanding of vernacular architecture observed during extensive travels around the world. The Castle Acre Water Tower is a light and delicate frame supporting a heavy mass of steel water tank above and acted as a landmark that marks the end of historic village where it's sited. The project celebrates and continues the life of the structure by converting it into a home that benefits from its unique form and panoramic views of the surrounding barley fields. The restoration of the tower ensures its existing values are retained by giving life back to its structural system and exposing its robustness and materiality. And um, we're very happy today to welcome Mike Tonkin. Over the last 20 years, Mike has taught and lectured at numerous schools of architecture on a number of subjects, including world vernacular architecture. Um, I'm gonna say thank you, Mike, for joining us today. And I understand it's the first talk on the Water Tower. So we're very honored to welcome you here. And we look forward to hearing more about this very beautiful project. So over to you, Mike. Vanessa, I'm going to show, share my screen. So I hope everyone's seeing that. Um, so uh, is everybody seeing that? Is that fine? Hello? That looks great, Mike. Thank yep. you. All good. Okay, so, so um, we're in Castle Acre um, in Norfolk. And uh, Castle Acre is quite, a, as its name suggests, has an amazing castle and uh, the best Norman castle in Britain. Um, it has a priory, it has a bailey gate, and um, it has a water tower. And uh, the Norman castle is quite extraordinary. Um, the bailey gate is a very rare survival in a kind of village. It would have been a fortified village. And the priory is also an incredibly inspiring set of buildings. Um, and in case of the water tower, sort of, uh, to quite a few inspiring um, uh, influences in, in these big Oriel windows and the smaller windows that uh, are in the kind of ruins of the, um, the Priory and the surrounding buildings. And also there's some, a couple of really beautiful spiral staircases. Um, so the water tower is the kind of modern ruin of Castle Acre and um, um, it was bought by Dennis Pedersen um, at auction for £20,000. He was bidding against someone who wanted to buy it for scrap metal. Um, it's just on the north, it was on the top of that map, I should have pointed out where it was. So it greets people to, as they enter the village. And for the village, it's quite an important kind of gateway. And um, it's not just a gateway, it was a, also a kind of rite of passage, because an awful lot of the people who grew up in a village climbed it in their youth. And, um, and you, as you can imagine, it's quite an adventure to climb it. So, um, and now um, I'm going to I run you through how we've managed to sort of develop uh, this project with Dennis. Over the, over the years and um, what the main aims are. So as a practice, we try to do um, projects that are very particular to nature, people and place. And I'm going to kind of, first of all, so we talked about place there a little bit. And um, as, as, I, as I show you um, each space, I'm going to say how that space and relates to a different facet of nature. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the tank. Um, the tank um, is, a, is a steel tank. Um, the water tank originally has been here since uh, for 70 years, so it's survived. So, um, and um, the planners uh, in their first response said they didn't think it was worth keeping, but actually um, Dennis really felt it was worth keeping and actually that it's a sort of a modern um, monument that's part of a village, just as the ancient monuments are part of a village. And its utilitarian role in supplying water is just as important as uh, another tourist venue in, in the village. So. It was kind of redeemed and, uh, and somehow but Dennis's kind of passion for the water tower sort of came out of, he, he has a sort of fascination with things mechanical and things uh, and water towers in themselves. 
and he has a bit of a taste for kind of thunderbirds as well which i think is an important facet of well, the way we've operated here. The tank itself is really beautiful and it was, the panels are painted because they were moved from another location. It was on a water, it was on an airfield before it was in this field and um, it was being uh, taken apart and reconstructed. Um, but we felt in this case, we shouldn't reconstruct it. We should make the most of everything that's here. And, and, and I'm gonna show you how we've done that. So the experience of sort of coming up to the top of a tower was always a fairly scary experience and um, when you're in the tower, um, obviously there was no view out before, but the temptation in a lot of water towers is to make one big window. But here we felt the water tank, well, for one, it was always full of water, so it was always kind of level. And the other thing is actually, because it's on the top of a hill, it has a really beautiful 360 degree view of the horizon. So somehow we felt a kind of cut was a better way of making a hole in the tank. Um, and that cut then connects you to the horizon and connects you to a kind of changing weather on the horizon. So this is a picture when it's under construction. And um, the structural engineer is Mervyn Rodriguez from Rodriguez Associates, um, a fantastic engineer. We love working with Mervyn. And um, when we first thought of making the cut, we thought we might have to keep one or two of the panels um, to give stability to it. But uh, Mervyn was, no, 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 you don't have to do that. You can just use the window frames. So. What you're seeing here is the scaffolding in the distance, but actually then the window frames are doing all the work. So they're just 60 by 60 with, I think, a 10 mil or 8 mil wall thickness. And they basically, and behind them, and what you don't see is doing all the hard work is a truss that's put onto the back of the steel plates. So the steel plates are used to do what they do well. They work well in shear, and the truss kind of reinforces that. And then the top and bottom of the tank act as a kind of um, lateral support. So there's the tank finished with the kind of cut um, and Velux window, uh, Vel Velfac windows are just put behind those frames. So you get this 360 degree view of the horizon. Um, what we did have to do when we made that cut was to then stabilize the tower because the top of the tower would um, rotate um, in, in relationship to the bottom um, in, in, under wind load. So basically we had to use the stair tower to stabilize it. So this is one of Mervyn's drawings showing the kind of truss arrangement. And what you see in the bottom drawing, the blue there shows you how that, uh, the forces that are uh, redirected to the, the lid of the stair tower. So the stair tower becomes the enabling um, structural member. And um, the other thing we did in, with the water tank is when we saw it as a ruin, it had some holes in the roof. So it had beautiful top light and that top light fell onto the um, rusty walls of the tank and made them beautiful. So we felt that we needed to kind of introduce top light too. And otherwise you were going to always be looking at the panels in silhouette as you looked out at the brighter view. So we made one big skylight in the center that you can walk on. And then we mirrored all four sides of it. So if you look at Dennis's um, Instagram site, you'll see he's done a really beautiful film of the clouds passing through the kind of mirrored ceiling, uh, through the mirrored effect of the, uh, the skylight. Um, and then of course the cut through the tank, um, gives you this incredible view of the horizon and gives you this slightly sort of um, gravity-defying um, effect. You see, you're seeing underneath the water tank there, but you see underneath it too, because that's the original structure. So how it works firmly is the tank is kind of super insulated on the outside, um, that, that uh, truss is enclosed um, in insulation and then rendered. And um, that gave the tank back the kind of color it was originally. And then at the back, you see the stair tower and linking the stair tower to, to, to the uh, body of a tower is a kind of bridge that enters the rooms. So underneath it is the kind of frame. So the frame was basically full of the, uh, the water coming and going and the access. And um, Dennis managed to keep an awful lot of that and a lot of the ladders then got reused inside. Um, but what you did see when you went up the frame is you look down on this field of barley, which is absolutely beautiful when it blows in the wind. Um, and so the idea was that when we infilled the frame, the frame should be very much about focusing on the wind blowing the barley. And um, so each room is more or less a cube. Um, and in that cube, we placed um, a mezzanine. So you can get a bed in, a bathroom, and above it, you can have sort of children's sleeping space. So um, when you look from the village, so this is the back of one of the houses that's closest, um, we didn't want the room to face towards the village because we would get kind of um, light pollution. So we wanted to make um, the, the, the articulation of the tower um, 
in the best arrangement for the people of the village. And actually, it's worth saying that um, another thing that's really amazing about what Dennis did, I think, is, is um, through going to the local pub, um, he managed to meet sort of almost everybody in the village. And um, through that, those contacts actually found most of the people who ended up building um, the, the, the project because Dennis became the kind of um, uh, almost main contractor and um, and then project managed the whole project. And um, he did that with a whole host of people who were incredibly supportive. And when uh, we went to the parish council, Dennis and I, to talk about the project um, in the lead up to planning, um, it, it, um, people were kind of incredibly supportive. And in the planning application, I think there were 25 people kind of supporting uh, letters of support. I and mean, then there were two sort of um, detractors. Uh, they were both people who lived locally, but generally there was an incredible um, support, well of support from the village to do something. So what we did is we put the kind of stair tower facing towards the people so there'd be no light pollution. And then Dennis put a clock on the top of the tower to give back. And then the, uh, those rooms that infill the frame are then overlooking the field of barley and you're in a kind of honey colored timber um, room overlooking the same color in the field below. And in the lower rooms, you kind of look more at the cherry tree that's right in front of you. And in the higher room, you look out over the field itself. And this is the lower, the, this is the lowest level, um, which is um, uh, also serves as a sort of living space as well. And this was on the open day and that field was kind of full of cars. And I think a thousand people turned up for the open day. Um, so. It is a kind of local landmark and um, people really love the fact that it's been brought back to life. So um, the fact that something could have been sold for scrap and has actually then been turned into a kind of another um, saved ruin of Castle Acre. Um, so this is how the, the rooms work with a kind of volume. Um, so the large window to the north doesn't open. Um, and um, it is because it, it's facing north. You're not going to get a, you're not going to get any overheating. But what we needed to do was put two windows to either side, one at low level and one at high level, so we could get cross ventilation to purge, and also so the top window could kind of let the heat out in a kind of thermal chimney effect. Um, and that's one of the ladders that was salvaged from underneath the, the space. And then you enter um, the frame, the rooms in the frame through the bridge, and the bridge kind of. As you cross from the stair tower into the frame, the bridge sort of connects you with the trees to either side. It also connects you to the kind of east and the west, the setting and rising of the sun. And, um, and you feel like you're suspended in space as you kind of cross that void. Um, and, and as you go across, you're going into the kind of view beyond there. So, and it's as if you're walking externally because we've kind of brought the cladding to the inside as well. Um, so there's the bridge at night and um, and then we'll just talk about the stair quickly. So, so we have a steel water tank, but of course, um, in the wind used to sway around quite a lot. And actually for a water tank, that's not a problem. Um, but for a house, it is. And um, every window would leak if the building moved too much. So it was really important we stabilize the whole structure. So ironically, we've stabilized the steel structure with a timber structure. Um, and we did that by kind of um, um, using what we call a compression spiral. So if you look at a gastropod, um, a seashell, um, any force that's applied to the outside is sent to the inside, to the spiral, and then redistributed through, through the structure, natural structure itself. So learning from nature, um, we, we also learning from kind of Georgian staircases, these cantilevered staircases that sort of um, uh, cantilever out and where the load of one step is given to the other. So it only needs three points of contact, two in the wall and one where it joins to the stair below. So we made a kit and uh, the kit was made of CLT um, and Mervyn calculated that the walls could just be 80 mil thick and um, the stair treads then as they go up, they're, they're literally starting from the bottom and you work your way to the top. And each uh, riser is made out of two sections and those two sections, one of the sections slots into the outer wall and then they're all screwed together. So the whole thing works uniformly as a single structure. So this is just under construction. Um, and here it is finished um, and it spirals up towards um, a skylight of the same form of a void. And um, in England, generally, when you make a stair, um, you make a kind of a straight flight and, and, um, and then a kind of a, an array in the corner. But in France, if you look at most staircases, they have an array all the way around. And actually, um, we wanted to kind of bring that kind of French influence. Um, Monsieur Dennis's partner is from France. And, 
and we always felt that was nice to kind of make a reference to that. So they fan all the way around and um, as you go up through. And then the um, balusters are actually made out of the rods that were in the tank, but stopped the tank from kind of um, expanding outwards with tension rods. And then the handrail is like one of those from school, but it's a sort of plastic cover on the top. And then the other thing the stair does is it acts as a thermal chimney. So it has very little windows in it, as you saw from the facade, it's very blank. And that's because we wanted it to kind of be a thermal passage um, without much heat inside it. So you open the doors at the bottom, just like you would in these um, towers in Shabam. So these are sort of six to eight stories tall. And the stair tower in each case is used to actually cool the building um, as it sort of acts as a kind of thermal chimney. And in this case in Yemen, they paint these walls of the stair with egg white to make the air move more smoothly. So there's the set of section of showing how the kind of air comes up through it. And then the cross ventilation in the other rooms and how we put light into the center of the plan, um, how all the walls are kind of super insulated. Um, and also we have an MVHR system in here. Um, so um, integration were the um, ME engineers for us and, um, and, and they did a great job along with Mervyn and um, introduced sort of very simple principles. Um, there's an air source heat pump that brings energy to the building and um, the duct runs up the back of the building and then has to go out through this sort of contorted route because it's going in and out again. Um, but it's in plan, it's very simple how um, the services serve each of the rooms. Um, so the whole building is more or less conceived as a kind of kit and that kit is um, um, basically made of CLT. So the TL CLT, as I said, strengthening um, the, uh, the, the steel structure. And the staircase is an incredibly kind of good value for money way of adding uh, a great deal of structural stability um, through a kind of um, a kit made uh, a sort of digital fabrication um, and kit made structure and the, um, um, uh, the CLT uh, people also did an amazing job. So that's been to Holtz for the uh, main supplier. So, so that, that's, the, uh, that's the sort of um, summary of how uh, the building works. So it's kind of um, thermally controlled. Um, we're using passive principles to kind of cool it and um, to avoid it overheating. And, um, and there's a sort of, uh, we're, we're minimizing the amount of energy we put into the building. And in the way the building's made, not only are we trying to connect people to nature because that's not just because that's our agenda, but just because when you're in such a beautiful location, that seems like exactly the right thing to do. So thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Mike, for that um, very beautiful talk on such a great building. I think looking at your images, it just makes you realize what an ambitious project and client yeah. you had. Because the water tower, maybe I'm lacking architectural imagination, but to me that doesn't shout home. So it, it seems incredibly um, sort of forward thinking. And you also talked a lot about the kind of reuse of materials, which is really interesting, I think. What was the brief from the client? So sustainability was on the it was a really big driver for Dennis and um, I think in almost every conversation it was you know um, we want to get the sort of best environmentally out of things the best structurally out of it and actually then you know for us you know beauty and cost are actually very much related so we personally always want to make the kind of most efficient and cost effective way of doing anything so um, that can give you kind of great value for money but it can also give you a project that has sustainability shouldn't be a really expensive building that costs a fortune and has bronze louvers and um, you know that don't really open because um, you know it's in the middle of a city you should be building as cost effectively as you can and um, so I think Dennis's ambition um, really helped kind of place this project into a kind of environmental uh, agenda. Yes great and I think the one thing that does come across is the collaborative nature of the project um, and I should say, um, in terms of collaboration, if anyone has a question, they can put it into the chat function on Zoom and I can ask Mike. Um, the engineers obviously were important. Um, Michael's saying great that you name checked them, but it seems like it sort of had support from the wider community as well. So that must have made a difference to the project. A massive difference, I think. And, and in some ways, the way the whole thing was made was very much part of a kind of... Um, community act almost you know the fact that the parish council behind it from the beginning and the local community was behind it 
um, really made a huge difference. And I mean, I'm not sure how many open days attract a thousand people, but um, I think Dennis might be doing another one this summer, but I would imagine uh, it'll there'll probably be even more people now. People know about it a bit more. Yes, I can imagine it has become a sort of architectural tourist landmark just because it's so unique as well as a project, I think, sort of that yeah. change of use so dramatically. And it does still sit really, obviously it sits very beautifully within the landscape and the, the connection with the barley field. How are the family finding living there? And what's also really nice is the family were very involved in the whole project and Dennis has uh, four sons and they're all been involved in the project. And uh, I was, I think you saw Lockie in one of the pictures at the top of the stair there. But um, uh, there's nearly always somebody there now and, um, and that's really nice that um, one of Dennis's older sons are sort of living there for, at the moment. And they're backwards and forwards all the time. So I think they've been spending more and more time there. And uh, lockdown, it was the perfect place to escape, you know, you can see yes, people coming. Right. And you're, so I think, so that, that was good for them. And um, yeah, I think it's become a kind of contribution to the village in a way. And, and I think that's also about sustainability, about how to do things locally and keep the carbon footprint down because uh, actually you keep everything local. Yes, great that they had four sons. That's an instant construction team, isn't <laughs> well, it? They also had a fantastic father-son team as, as the people who built it, who did most of the building work. Um, and they're really amazing, Ben and Nigel, and uh, they did an incredible job. The pictures of their, I didn't show, show the pictures of them building the stair, but there's step by step, they started at the bottom and worked their way to the top. And um, I almost would have liked to do that one myself, actually, that was a, that would have been a nice construction job. Yes, that sounds, sounds brilliant. There's a couple of technical questions that have come up. Um, what's the roof terrace surfaced with and how are the layers built up on top of the lid of the tank? Um, so it had to be laid to falls and um, the roof um, did get a bit thicker in planning because uh, there's an awful lot of force going through the roof because it's taking all those wind loads in a lateral form across to the top of a tower. Um, it has, so it has a sort of, it's laid to falls and then it has um, upstands that then catch a steel frame that's galvanized that's around the edge that gives you the balustrade and inside that there's a frame, a timber frame that then has a kind of a, a reconstituted timber deck because the timber decks um, uh, get mouldy very quickly in that environment. So, um, so the timber decks flush and the solar panels are up there too. I don't think they show it in that picture, but it has um, PVs on the roof as well. Um, someone's commented actually, Jonathan's asked about the stairs. Uh, what if a lift would be needed later? Is there sort oh, of... There's already a lift in there and um, yeah, there's a lovely orange lift in the corner that's incredibly slow. But it's mainly it's mainly for for bags and shopping and um, occasionally uh, and yeah. So Dennis also added really nice colours to the scheme. So the, the lift is or orange, and if you when you go into the bathrooms, they're all lined in fiberglass, and they get brighter in colour as you go towards the top. Yes, I mean it's a beautiful um, vertical living. I can imagine has its challenges, but I'm sure we'd all give it a go living in that lovely building. Um, another quick, just time for a couple more quick questions. Uh, Ed wants to know more about the profile metal cladding. Uh, so the profile metal cladding, it looks like it's Wrigley tin, but it's not. Um, Dennis found a kind of recycled aluminium plastic mix, um, which is going to stay kind of um, bright and reflect the light. And what's quite beautiful about it is um, it does, in the mist, it reflects the mist and uh, you, it's part of the color of the mist. And Dennis said somebody recently was going past and called him because it looked like the water tower was on fire because it was reflecting the setting sun and the whole thing had gone orange. Wow. So, um, so, so in a way, making that kind of uh, reflective surface, it almost makes it more part of its, the environment that surrounds it. That's incredible. Um, last question from Claire, which actually ties into the PhD that you've been doing. Um, Claire mentions that you had referenced the Yemeni buildings. Are there any other particular buildings, traditions in the world that stand out to you in terms of sustainability? Um, I do a couple of talks, one called Hot and Dry and another one called Hot and Wet. And, and Hot and Wet one's all about Ind uh, Indonesia and about a kind of hut that traveled from China. Uh, and as it traveled each time it went, it, it adapted to the environment. And it ends up, um, before it ends up in Taiwan, being buried in the ground to avoid the hurricanes, it ends up in Nias. And uh, Nias is a, a, where Banda Ashe is um, in, in Sumatra. 
and it's sort of earthquake zone. So these incredible buildings resist earthquakes. And when the earthquake came, everything was kind of flattened apart from these buildings and they're something like 250 years old, but they all survived. So sustainability is understanding things on a kind of structural and an environmental level and a, and a constructional level so that uh, they, will, they will last a long time and actually they will work with the environment. Great, that's a beautiful place to end a very inspiring and lovely talk. And good luck with your PhD, which sounds like it's, it's gonna be fascinating. Um, we'd love to maybe get some snippets of it to publish when you finish, when you're through. Um, thank you for joining us today. I mean, huge thanks to Mike. That was a brilliant talk. All the talks from the four, um, the series on retrofit, the four talks that we've already done are available on our YouTube channel, along with the woodwork series that we did earlier this year. Um, you can follow us on Instagram, the Building Centre. Online talks will kick off again in September with more sustainability sessions. And we'll be hosting some in real life stuff over the summer. So do come and join us at the Building Centre. You can also come and see our conversations about climate change. Exhibition with the Timber Trade Federation. So a massive thank you, Mike. That was a really very lovely um, and inspiring talk on what is a wonderful home in a in a great setting but such an unusual start to the story um yeah thank you so much for joining us thank and you for me. it's been a pleasure thank you see you soon take care thank you bye thank you goodbye <laughs>